So that means we have close to a full half acre of backyard and of dirt. <laughs> that is a massive backyard. So with a dimension of eight inches wide, our footing needed to be about 24 inches deep. That's maybe a little na narrow and a little shallow. I wanted to create a waterproof seal between the cap and the top of the posts, so I decided to use Dynaflex Ultra by DAP. This might be a stretch. Today's video is brought to you by our good friends over at Nationwide Industries, the Fence Pro's number one choice. And they are this Fence Pro's number one choice for a couple reasons. One, we love using their Keystone Traverse latches. They're easy to install. You simply bolt them onto the post. No drilling for rods or cutting the rods required. It's a pretty straightforward installation process. We also love using their full line of galvanized hardware. It shows up quickly and reliably. All right, guys, today's video is titled Horizontal Fence Full by the Pneumatic Addict. I like that channel name. So horizontal fencing is something that we get requests for a lot, and I'd be interested to see how these folks pull it off. If you'd like to watch the entire video in its entirety without my commentary, we will link to it in the description below. Our property is a full acre and our house sits pretty much on the front half. So that means we have close to a full half acre of backyard and of dirt. <laughs> is a massive backyard. So today we are going to begin to build a really cool horizontal wood fence. There are several different ways to construct a wood fence. We decided the easiest way to attach the horizontal slats to the fence posts was to simply screw them to the face of each post. We could then follow up with a decorative one by four trim board to cover up the seam and expose screws. An additional one by four cap attached to the top would help give us that sleek modern look we were looking for and also prevent the ends of the boards and posts from absorbing too much water over time. I've seen a few variations on this, the standard width board for the entire height of the fence. One that we tend to like to do is a kind of a, a varying width. So we we'll use some four inch, some six inch, some seven and a half inch wide boards, either gradually going from thicker at the bottom to thinner at the top. So seven and a half at the bottom to four at the top or mix and matching them. Interesting to see how the uh, cap turns out. The plan was to tie in the wood fence to the existing block wall on the far east side of the house. We then used an oversized surveyor's measuring tape and measured from the house, the block wall in the east, and the block wall behind us to give us more or less a straight line across the property. We also laid out a small angled section in the corner and about 30 feet for the fence to return at a perpendicular angle. We used steel stakes and mason line to mark the back edge of where the fence posts needed to line up. So I like the idea that you, they used multiple stakes. So obviously using a string line, which for uh, the DIY, or this, these folks actually seem a little bit probably more than DIY. It seems like they know what they're up to. String lines aren't a bad idea. It lets you visualize exactly where the fence is going to go in relation to maybe making sure it's perpendicular to the wall or making sure it looks right from the back porch, that sort of thing. One drawback would be that the wind could blow that string line as your setting post. Uh, you could bump them, that sort of thing. But as long as you pay attention and, and just make sure you watch the details of that line, you're typically fine. So I like the fact that they're using multiple stakes so that they can keep that line straighter over a greater distance, even when the wind blows. We then mark the location for the wood posts that would be set in concrete every eight feet along the length. If you're unsure about what size footing you need for your fence posts, I left a link to a concrete footing calculator in the description box below. The rule of thumb I've always gone by is three times the diameter of the post is the width of your hole and then 30 inch minimum deep with caveat of frost depth. Now, it uh, looks like they're not in an area that gets too frosty. Uh, so 30 inches will be fine. Six inches below frost depth if you're uh, in a place that the frost depth is below 30 inches. Uh, you would find that typically in your county ag extension. We wanted to use an eight inch diameter auger that came with a fence post hole digger that we could rent from our local Home Depot. So with a dimension of eight inches wide, our footing needed to be about 24 inches deep. That's maybe a little na narrow and a little shallow. Eight inches, an eight inch auger, um, well, it depends on what kind of posts we're using, I guess. There's wood posts in the background though. So, you know, if they're three and a half inch, if it's a four by four, they're typically three and a half inches. Uh, it will be 10 and a half inch hole would be the rule of thumb. A uh, 10 inch auger wallered out a little bit would probably be uh, sufficient, but an eight inch auger might make for a bit too small of a hole. This hole right here is dangerously close to our main water supply line that runs from the well to our house. So we're gonna hand dig it just to be safe. 
Always a good idea. I hope they've got their utilities marked, but if it's water from a well, that's technically a private utility. So anytime you think you're anywhere near utilities, hand digging is probably the best bet. And it was time to start setting the wood post. We purchased an inexpensive concrete mixer off of Craigslist last year when we put in our front steps. If you haven't seen that video, you'll definitely want to check it out. I'll leave a link in the description box. We are super frugal DIYers and I'm always trying to show you guys ways to save money. So they're using a pre-bagged concrete mix. We do here as well. Uh, I like the idea of pre-mixed concrete or pre-bagged concrete uh, because you get a consistent mix in every hole. They're using sacrete, we use quickrete. You get consistent mixture hole to hole. But with this size of project, if you don't already own a concrete mixer, I highly, highly recommend you look into renting one. Trust me, your shoulders and hands will thank you. Once we set each post in the concrete, we nailed on a temporary two by two brace to make sure that the post- I like the fact that they poured the concrete in, then pre-mixed it, poured it in, and then they're sinking their post to make sure they fully encapsulate the post. It's definitely gonna make for a sturdy post. You see you see different installation techniques depending on uh, where you look, I guess. Different applications for different folks. There's a bunch of different ways to do it, to each their own, but I think she's off to a good start. It was plumb on all four sides while the concrete cured. We also nailed scrap boards. This might be an excessive step. I mean, you could stab them or sink them into the concrete and then come, you know, plumb them while you're doing that. Once you get to your last post, circle back around, just check plumb front to back, starting with post one through post whatever. And then after that, it's typically firm enough to hold up. I don't, I don't know that the extra bracing is necessary, but it also gives peace of mind, I guess, to make sure they're exactly spot on. If you're thinking those posts look awfully tall, here's why. Okay, the plan is we are going to use a laser to make sure that all of our posts are level with the top of our concrete block fence over here. Problem is the laser doesn't show up too great outside, so the sun is just about set and we are going to try to do it during dusk. Hopefully we can see our laser. I like the idea, yeah, using a laser level to make sure they're nice and level with the top of the wall or they're in line with the top of the wall. Be a good look. At this point, Bryce used a circular saw with the blade at full depth to cut around the posts and to trim them to their final height. Bryce worked in construction for over 10 years and often used similar techniques when he was framing house. I like the fact that they're cutting the posts before they've even put a single rail up. A lot of times the mistake I see is that the post will be left tall and then they'll try to be cut once the rails and pickets are up. By cutting them now, nothing's in your way. He can walk all the way around and cut it. I like that technique a lot. Or as she had said, you could use a reciprocating saw, but doing it before the rails and pickets are up is a top-notch step. With the posts all trimmed to their correct height, it was time for me to apply stain. We like the look of black steel fence posts, so I chose an opaque deck stain in the color charcoal by Bear. Outdoor products like those designed to be applied to a deck provide both color and moisture protection protection in one product. I like the fact that she stained it. Uh, she talked about it maybe prolonging the life, which is absolutely true. The problem is she didn't stain it before they went in the ground. Typically where you see where you see the most rot is in the aerobic zone of the soil, the first few inches of the soil or or where it makes contact with the concrete if it that's above grade. Could have stain them beforehand and then put them into the concrete just for that added step. She could also use a product like a uh, post saver product. It's a sleeve that's heat shrunk and then sealed with bitumen onto the post to make sure it doesn't rot. It comes with a warranty and everything. Nice step staining these, uh, but to really protect it, maybe should be done sooner before they get put in the concrete. While waiting for the posts to dry, I started working on the horizontal fence slats. Rough sawn lumber, as opposed to the smooth milled lumber like you typically find at Home Depot, is a much better material for outdoor use, especially if you're going to apply a finish to it. The rough texture on the surface absorbs more product, creating a much better barrier against moisture and also being a lot less likely to flake. You see the difference a lot of times in finished fences that are stained afterwards, or even pre-stained fences, where the two befores are typically smooth sawn, the pickets are typically typically rough sawn, so the pickets don't perfectly match the rails. The pickets or the rails tend to be a little bit lighter than the pickets because they're smooth. They don't absorb the stain as well. Now, she didn't say whether these were cedar or pine. I'm not familiar with rough, rough sawn pine, but it certainly could be a pressure treated product. Uh, it's likely cedar, which staining it right at the time is absolutely, or right before she installs it is absolutely fine. If it's a treated product, she'd want to wait a little bit uh, for the product to dry out, for the for the treatment to cure, just to make sure that coat stays nice and even. On the horizontal slats, I applied two coats of a semi-transparent deck stain in the color Redwood. 
After letting the boards dry for a couple of days. All right, so she's going for the two-tone look. Dark post, a little bit lighter rails. I think that'll turn out pretty nice. The boards we used were 16 feet long, which is wide enough to cover two panels. But we needed to start with one smaller eight foot panel against the fence. If we attached all eight foot boards on that smaller panel, we would end up with perfectly vertical seams every 16 feet along the fence, which could be potential weak spots. Instead, we decided to stagger the 16 foot boards and then infill the gaps with a few more eight foot boards, creating staggered and ultimately stronger seams. I think uh, I think she's right on the right on the money here. A lot of times you do see you do see all the seams line up. You wouldn't actually see it just because she's covering it up with a picket, but she's got a great point that it would make for a weaker fence by overlapping it. You actually spread the load further down the fence. We found the easiest way to get these heavy horizontal boards in place was to first use a nail gun to temporarily tack them to the posts. We could then follow up with outdoor rated deck screws. So uh, I guess it didn't necessarily choose nail versus screw. They just decided to go with both for good measure. It took us about a day and a half to install 121 slats. We attached the- I don't understand though. So maybe this is maybe this is the angle though. We just talked about this in the video. They shouldn't have all their, their boards have the same seam. So this is confusing, but this might be where they're changing directions. It's kind of hard to see, but it looks like they have at least another section before they change directions. Yeah, who knows, it could be an optical illusion. All the two by six fence slats are up. And then on the face where we have these ugly seams where the boards butt together, we wanna cover that up and make it look a little bit cleaner. So we have one by four fence pickets. They're the same width as the four by four posts behind them. And so we've painted them black. We are going to place them in front of the horizontal pickets um, and screw them into the posts behind covering up our seams and kind of bringing that black vertical accent to the front of the fence. Great tip as well, having it be the same width of your uh, post. That was, a lot of times you see guys use a little bit wider pickets, which we've done in the past as well, but keeping it the same width of the post is a little bit nicer of a look. I wanted to create a waterproof seal between the cap and the top of the posts, so I decided to use Dynaflex Ultra by DAP. Dynaflex Ultra is an advanced outdoor sealant that provides all weather protection, even in our intense air. This might be a stretch, but I, I understand they're trying to promote the product. So that's probably why they're creating this step. But uh, like I said, typically the rot occurs at the ground level. I've seen some really old fences that do have rot at the top of the post. But if we're talking about failure of the post, it's 99% of the time right at grade. At this point, the entire fence was built. I just had a few more finishing touches like covering up the exposed screw head. For that job, I pulled out one of my favorite products, DAP Premium Wood Filler. Again, probably another stretch for the for the promoted product here or sponsored product. I don't know. The screw heads, I guess, the screw heads are large enough to where that wood won't swell back over. But a lot of times, nail holes and screw head holes are typically lessened after the wood, after a few rains, the wood swells back up over it typically. Looks nice. accomplished nice so what i'm looking at the top line's nice and straight which obviously they shot a laser level across it so it's going to be nice and straight uh, also jealous of their perfectly flat uh, grade there so uh, the lot's not perfectly flat if you look at your bottom line here your bottom rails actually so it looks like the terrain falls so very nice top line nice and straight uh, bottom line looks like it contour somewhat as much as a horizontal fence can to grade as well. We're also really happy with the one inch facing creating a partial view fence. Although it doesn't hide the junkyard completely, we live in a super windy area and this design will be able to take a lot more wind. That's a fair point. I mean, it, allowing wind flow through the fence is obviously going to let it take on higher wind gusts. Uh, the wind load is going to be is going to be brought down a bit or the wind force, the wind pressure is going to be brought down quite a bit on the fence. Once we get landscaping in, including some trees, I think my view of the junkyard will have just the right coverage. Well, guys, let me know what you think about the fence. I think they did a great job. Let me know in the comments below what you think. What would you do differently? Until next time, I'm Joe Everest, the fence expert, reminding you that good fences make good neighbors, and I'll catch you next time.